welcome all good evening all welcome to this series on leaders inspire so the first edition of leaders inspire uh with the with the thoughts and the insights uh being shared by sandeep das transformation business leader and strategist advisor and mentor uh current times and unique challenges that it poses to the organizations a fantastic topic a relevant topic and we have a great speaker intent of this edition or this series of leaders inspire is to understand what is it that a leader does so differently that that makes him a leader it is the source of inspiration for all of us these leaders are our motivation they provide us the motivation and they make sure that we continuously move in the right direction so talking to a leader like uh sandeep is always a pleasure and that's how uh for all of us over here it will be an amazing experience today and that's what i can assure you a quick introduction uh sandeep das is successful and highly regarded international ceo business and strategic thought leader he started his career in 1978 as the management trainee in dcm shriram group followed by a stint with toyota motor corporation in middle east dubai At the age of 35 he became India's first private licensed telco CEO with Hutchinson Max uh, Telecom later Vodafone India in 1994 he then went on in 2006 to head Malaysia's Maxis group as group CEO and as board of director overseeing operations across Maxis Malaysia Aircel India Sri Lanka uh, Maxis Malaysia Airtel India, Sri Lanka Telecom, and Access Indonesia, based out of Kuala Lumpur. In 2013, he joined Reliance Jio as MD and CEO. In 2015, he left to do an EMP at Harvard Business School. He won the award of Best Malaysian CEO in 2012. He raised the latest, uh, largest telco IPO of USD 3.9 billion for Maxis. He was listed amongst. the 100 most powerful people in telecom globally by global telecom magazine for four years between 2009 and 2013 he was awarded lifetime achievement award for the contribution to indian telecom in 2016 by voice and data magazine he is currently on board of directors and an advisor to stellite technologies limited vedanta independent board of directors of green lamb industry telecom advisor to a leading international bank advisor to reputation management company ostrom an impanel consultant with the jerson lamen group and mentor advisor to startup companies he is also the president of the fms forum and intellectual alumni association of the faculty of management studies university of delhi sandeep graduated in mechanical engineering from national institute of technology raul keda in 1970 and then received an mba from fms university of delhi he is also an alumnus of and it's a pleasure indeed an honor to be talking to you before we go any further uh, am i talking to the right person the looks have changed the poster depicts something else and they well first of all <clears throat> thank you samir for that uh, mm. uh, very laudatory uh, introduction i'm truly flattered but humbled thank you and i want to say hello to everybody on uh, who's here to uh, hear us today well the um, uh, you are talking to me still that is sandeep das <laughs> but uh, you know <clears throat> you have heard about the uh, arab spring this is what i call the covid uprising so the okay. fauna the fauna and flora are trying to reclaim their habitat which is why <laughs> you can see me with this beard uh, well uh, samir uh, we are um, in a very unprecedented uh, situation with the covid and um, uh, what is very strange about this uh, pandemic is that it has caused a lot of fear and fear to my mind comes from a couple of reasons uh, one is that uh, you know in this particular uh, case there is no uh, vaccine at this point of time there is no cure at this point of time 
um, the the disease creeps in like a silent assassin. Um, you know, you don't know where it comes from and where it comes from. Uh, and then it is a bottomless pit. We don't know when and where is it going to eventually end. And so therefore there is, um, I have found out in my life that uh, people can deal with good news and bad news. But it's the uncertainty that kills people. You know, so the uncertainty, it's like walking into a dark alley and not knowing what to expect is what is causing a lot of fear around COVID. And um, it has been merciless in the sense it has had, it's not been, uh, had any discrimination at all. So whether it is race, religion, uh, region, age, gender, individuals, communities, uh, whether it's, um, whether you're wealthy or not wealthy, it has just been merciless and indiscriminate in the manner that it has affected everybody. But I would also say that, um, it has allowed us as a community to have a reset and a reboot button. We have pressed a reset and a reboot button. And we have all realized the knowledge of what it is to be human. So we have all individually and collectively had a lot of introspection. We have had a lot of resilience We're back to basics. We are enjoying the bountiful nature that surrounds us. And most importantly, we are realizing that we really need to survive with very little. And, um, and as my daughter keeps saying that it's a fine time to strip away the inessentials. You're right. So in a few days from now, um, my sister-in-law and her husband are doing a little program and it's entitled, we can't let the fear of dying stop us from living. And I think that summarizes in a way um, what we are really going through in this particular period. And you know, many years ago, Marie Curie said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we fear less. So I think there's too much happening in too short a time, but that's how I see COVID. <laughs> no, I know. I think, and, and very valid point in some way that you have connected it with what uh, Marie Curie has said. Uh, and it's important also. So, uh, Sandeep, taking to you the other, other question that I had in mind, and I think a lot of our friends over here, they have in mind. It. <laughs> what do you think? Although a lot of it is there, but then from your perspective, how do you think that the Indian economy would shape out in the next half of the year. I think a lot of us on this call and as it is when we meet up uh, with our colleagues, some of the other CEOs, when they meet up, we, we hear a lot of perspective, a lot of them. There are a lot of stories, there are a lot of perspectives. How do you see as a, as a leader, how do you see? With, your, with the wealth of experience that you carry, it will be very helpful for us to envisage what future holds for us. Well, first of all, Samir, I wish at this point of time, my surname was not Das, but Nostradamus. <laughs> and I could have peeked into the future and said what will happen. One thing is for sure that we are all deeply affected by what has happened in the economy. And I would, I would, in my own perspective, I would divide the economy into three possible periods. One is the period is the period that is existing currently. We don't know when this period will end. So the state of the economy continues to struggle during this period. When this period comes to an end, we will have another period, which I think would be the period of recovery. And some things will recover faster, recover slowly, but collectively the economy will start finding its feet. And then hopefully we will come to a point where things would stabilize and then the economy will begin to rise again and go back to the, to the, to its own prosperous ways. Um, you know, the prophets of doom have already signed off the economy and said it is closest to the dark recession of the 1930s. It's close to the, um, you know, Spanish uh, flu recession and then the world war two recession. But I think the good part is that, we have come through all these recessions as a community and as people. So nothing has a, everything has perhaps got an end date or a use by date 
if I may call it. Um, the Indian economy is uh, unfortunately uh, fraught with a lot of issues. One is that we have a massive population of self-employed, daily wages and migrant workers. Now this particular workforce forms almost about, I think the estimate is in the, in the region of about 70 to 75 percent of our workforce. Now compare this with the United States, which is perhaps in a low single digit of 3% or thereabouts. You will notice that um, a, a lot of these people have, have been very deeply affected and the others, uh, of course, can't go, go back to corporate jobs, etc. So our miseries are uh, not only in the numbers, but also in the nature of our economy. Um, we are more reliant on services than manufacturing. Uh, people have this debate about India versus China. I don't think we are ready as a juggernaut to replace that entire Chinese juggernaut of manufacturing, the financing, their political cloud, their military cloud. But we can pick holes in it somewhere. And we are not the only ones trying to get that business away from China. So, and these subsidies that we have made uh, are a big drain on our exchequer. And we have to think about how we'll recover that income. But like most countries, we have the challenge of balancing between, uh, you know, welfare and social obligations and investment. Um, the, the thing that worries me, Samir, is the fact that the distribution of wealth between the haves and the have-nots during this particular period has only widened in India. Right. And, I, and I'm worried about the fact that it is coupled with a lot of angst and hunger and anger and a lot of this could spark civil unrest and civil disobedience of laws and regulation that's what something as a nation we have to be collectively very caring about and we have to be very proactive about so there are reforms which are underway the policies which are underway but most of it is like changing the steam engine of a running train you know the, the issues are still there i think private and public partnership uh, is going to be key. And you know, we can't leave everything to the government. So as individuals, as communities, as companies, as private enterprises, we've got to all come together and see how we can solve it. Of course, the environment has to provide you the right policy framework, the right way for us to work together as a team. But it's not something that can be done by one entity alone. You know, unemployment, for example, has now risen from seven odd percent to about 26 percent and it's very scary it's almost a fourth of the work population it's very very scary and it's rising uh, we are our supply chain is under stress uh, the government income has come down uh, there's a collapse of services like hospital travel hospitality travel and other services there's reduced commercial activity like everywhere else in the world we'll have a challenge of getting the workforce back actually once they've, they've sort of gone and splintered all over the place you know, Dunn and Bradstreet calls it the global demand shock. So this is a demand shock of, of very high proportions. But you know, there's a saying that when the storm is raging, it is hard to figure out its damage unless it really dies down, you know. And a long-term slow rolling of the crisis over an uh, unknown factors and experiences and physical conditions are all adding to the issues. We are seized with the problem of not only providing a living, but providing a life. Yeah. So the question is, what will happen when it opens up? Will all the pent-up demand come up or will it be sluggish? And a friend of mine recently introduced me to a Chinese uh, phrase, term. And I hope I can pronounce it correctly. It says Bao Fu Sing Xiao Fei. Bao Fu Sing Xiao Fei is what is called revenge buying. So when, when after a period of lockdown, people sort of, with all their pent up emotions come down and buy, they buy with a vengeance. Well, that would be very exciting if that happens. Uh, but, but, and we have seen what opening of various um, departmental stores, etc., have done. But if you look at what the World Economic Forum says, they are a little more optimistic. They feel that there will be um, a growth of jobs from around 14, 15% right now to about 27%. Okay. They do acknowledge, they do acknowledge that, you know, 
75 million odd jobs across the world will be either displaced or replaced on account of what is happening. But they're also optimistic that about 130, 140 million jobs will actually be added. So if you look at the division of labor between humans, machines and algorithms, humans account for about 70 to 71% of the total task hours. And that is expected to go down to about 50, 58%. And algorithmic and, and, and machine uh, task hours, which are about 29 to 30% now, will probably rise to about 40, 42%. So that will be the change of equation that we will see in the world. And I, I think you have, you have beautifully put it. Yes, there are, there are certain things, 75 million jobs to be replaced. Uh, we made redundant and then 140 million jobs to be added. A lot of it actually, uh, it, there's a lot of positive uh, in times to come. So, Sandeep, the next question, I think all of us would be keen. What what would be the new world? Uh, how how the new world would look like? How would, how would you think uh, it will evolve? What do we see? You know, I think when we look at the new world, we have to look at one more aspect. And I think, the, uh, let me talk about the new world in two parts. One is the new world in terms of the role of leadership. And the other one is the new world in, in, in terms of what will the workplace look like. Uh, you know, there is an old Portuguese proverb which says when the sea is still, anybody can steer the ship. And I like the definition which says that leadership takes you to a place where you won't go by yourself. Never before in history has leadership been so challenged, whether it's from heads of states or heads of CEOs, departmental heads, heads of families, heads of migrant families. Should the father decide to take the family for walk 140 kilometers without food? It's a decision. It's the CEO of the, of the family taking the decision. So there are leadership decisions at every stage. Um, on one of the uh, interesting articles that I was reading in the Harvard Business Review, it talks about seven qualities that a leader should have under these circumstances. And they're all seven C's. The mm. first C is to be calm. Because when your mind is still and not agitated, you will take uh, you know, very objective decisions. The second thing is to be confident because when your leader is confident, the rest of the team, you know, in a place in a sense of hopelessness that surrounds us today, the confidence of a leader instills hope. The third part is in, a, in the time when we are not able to meet or we are not able to physically be around each other, communication is very, very important. You know, and it's, it, it, I would also extend the word communication to engagement because it quells or lightens uh, rumors that are, that are spreading all around because of lack of information. One of the things that COVID has taught us both things is collaboration. We can only win as a team. You know, you have a problem, you go your checked up, you get into self-quarantine. You know, these are things which are unheard of. So now you think of each other as, as collaborative. You have to help teams succeed. It's not about me. And then there's the larger issue about the community, you know, which I, which in my own words, I say informed citizenship. So you should, you have to understand that we are getting more social in our thinking. And if you don't do that, you know, the environment, the people, uh, the misery of the people who are downtrodden, you know, that's where comes the sixth C, which is compassion. Because if you're, if you, if you don't distribute uh, that across to the, economically challenged societies, you can't live in a balance. And the last one, of course, is essential for not only companies, but for individuals is cash. Companies must sit on cash because you have to save for a rainy day. And, uh, you know, you have to entrust trust-based cultures in that respect. So leaders, while putting out the fires, must also have an eye on the future. So that balance is very important. So short-term survival with long-term advantages. So let, let me now talk to you about the new world, the new workplace, as I see it. See, first of all, I think flexible work time is here to stay. Um, and we can't be reactionary anymore. 
when we when we get people back into the office we have to have reasons to go back to the office you know i'm just i'm just asking a very simple question because when you work from home you work smarter you work faster you were more productive so we will see some combinations of work from home and work in office some staff may be at at remote places some may be at home so depending on the various businesses i think we will see a proportion of work from home and work from the office it may vary from business to business depending on what businesses they are clearly service businesses may require more manning as opposed to other things but what is very important is that organizations will have to think of restructuring three or four things your organization structure itself has to go through a transformation and rechange because you are talking of new skills you are talking of people whom you need people you don't need so your entire people structure has to change your processes have to change because now you are you are dealing with things from outside creative inputs are coming in from the outside you are dealing with people distributed all over the country all over the world and finally even the physical shape of the offices are very very important because what are you building these offices for you don't want a situation where you are having a vacant middle seat in an aircraft because that seat is then redundant right so you are having to deal with it in an aircraft but you can certainly change it in an office because you'll have to work according to the way you work now because and you have to be cognizant about it otherwise you'll have buildings where you'll try and retrofit people into the new work style let me give you an example uh, for something like a like um, let's say hospitals you know hospitals were the most strained and stressed uh, the medical practice was very heavily strained and what happened is that there was a surge in demand and obviously they were not prepared for this surge now how do organizations deal with sudden sudden surges and sudden falls so what do hospitals do they ran out of beds they ran out of icus they ran out of things so they started doing what armies used to do in world war 2 is to get back tents and camps so now we have to think of a way in which hospital premises have to have tents and camps you know because you will have to think of ways and means to deal with that surge you have to deal with expansion and contract suddenly you will expand suddenly suddenly migrant workers have to be sent out of the city in transportation is expansion then suddenly that demand will go down and you will have to bring them back so there's no point thinking at that time that people are not able to come back then instead of taking care of people in the hospitals you are now taken care to the individual to their houses you're saying stay at home i'll give you telemedicine i'll give you advice so you will have distributed care now so you're rethinking your entire model you will have to categorize people who are who can be treated as lightly sick who are sick and those who need severe uh, treatment and they have to be categorized within your hospital premises you know there was a there was an israeli uh, hospital called i think the name was rampan hospital in haifa which during the war it used to convert it in entire underground parking to uh, to to a hospital now that's the kind of flexibility you will need during the crimean war she had specified hospitals to be sick beds to be 6 feet away from each other think about social so and windows to be open fresh sunlight to come in then of course the spanish flu happened world war happened and the beds got closer because the space was inadequate then because of special treatment wards became rooms now we may have to think about touch free lighting you know nobody touches anything it's just touch free lighting you walk in lighting comes in you have to have micro resistant building materials i work i sit on the board of a company that produces laminates which is that resistant now those are the kind of changes that you think that you will do in a hospital design i've only spoken of a fraction of things that people must be thinking of but every business will have to rethink itself on these lines the other thing is also that in the marketplace all those large fmcg kind of companies that are for years and years built retail and all those kind of things will suddenly find that consumer behavior has now changed 
people are now more conducive to mm. online and they're more conducive to doing things uh, through, through, through telephones and digital. So therefore, all those physical distribution points that you've created and invested in are suddenly finding themselves competing with, with a David. And suddenly David is taking on Goliath. So companies will have to reinvent themselves. So you're seeing the rise and rise of digital. And I always keep saying that from now on, there'll be only two kinds of companies, those that are digital and those that are dead. <laughs> So now look at sales and service, for example, in another company that I sit on the board of, they have stopped taking sales calls going overseas. They find it more useful to have the CEO, the CTO, the CMO all sitting across their customers, meetings arranged overnight, two hour meetings, problem solved, no strain of traveling, doing those expenses. During these times, assets are distressed. So people are looking at collaborating, getting assets that are available where cash flow is required, new financial projections have to be made about the business. You have to scale your business accordingly. And this, and they are saying, this is the way we do things here. So the, the biggest challenge again is for HR and for CEOs to say, what is going to be the culture of the company? Because you don't sit together anymore. How will you create a culture with people far off and just remotely not located with you? Right. How do you, I mean, so it's, it's, how do you do this with remote working? How do you deal with something like loyalty to the company when somebody is sitting somewhere else? He doesn't even come to your office. So there is a very famous saying that absence is to love what wind is to fire. So those people actually, if they are wholesome employees, they have the right work-life balance, they sit with their families. They are more productive work hours as they're opposed to laboring for hours and hours and hours. And I'm reminded of what my friend uh, Ariana Huffington used to say. She says, we think mistakenly that success is the result of the time we put in at work instead of the quality of time that we put in. COVID, has told, us, COVID has told us very clearly the difference between spending time and the quality of time. Therefore, I'm, I'm challenging whether you need to have eight to nine hour work hours. You know, so it's, it's very interesting. So less is actually more. There are no rooms and offices. It is anytime, anywhere, everywhere, because you are connected. There are no departments anymore. There are project teams. They come together for something, then they go away for something. So you, there are no silos. There is the democratization of ideas. Even the youngest guy can sit in the meeting and give you an idea. You don't have to wait for hierarchical meeting. And innovation is an infectious disease after that because adversity brings in innovation. Right. I, I, the other day I was talking to you and look at the way you and GACS have done the School of Excellence, for example. I mean, it's another example. Of course, I'll let you talk more about it. But it is how you all have during that particular time. The sad part is that retrenching and downsizing is almost inevitable. And as much as companies are trying to save employees through salary cuts and all those kind of things, there will come a point of time where retrenching and, re and downsizing will happen. We have to deal with it with compassion. But it will have to be done. Uh, companies that are sitting now idle have to expand markets. They have to get closer in their relationships with people. It's very, very important to stay connected with your ecosystem, whether it's your suppliers, your vendors. And this is a wonderful way of remaining connected because you do your Zoom calls, you do your uh, you know, voice calls and video calls, but you are able to, stay, you're not planning a visit, you're not planning a glass of wine with them, you're not planning dinner with them, but you're talking to them every day, just the way you and I are talking to each other right now. And Absolutely. A, couple of, a couple of hundred people are, watching and getting communicated and staying in touch. So I think the other thing is that companies will have to think very seriously about automating whatever they can, because now it is inevitable. Uh, you, wherever things were man now automate, find new ways to deliver your service. You are going to do what I call a new executive toolkits. So these are some of the thoughts. I mean, I could go on and on, but you know, I, there are no, but very, very, very valuable thoughts. Very valuable thoughts. Philippe. And uh, 
So, so a lot of these things resonate, right? I think people over here, they're definitely somewhere or the other speaking about it. That's the big elephant in the room, retrenching and salary cuts. I think, but then the other part is we will have to take up, uh, we will have to handle it uh, with utmost compassion. There is, there is, there is no way that we can just put a blind eye to it. This is inevitable. The way everything is being shaped up and something that you're talking about automation, I think absolutely in, in, in some of the, uh, uh, in some of the webinars that we have been doing, uh, we have leaders who have been talking about that, you know, we don't know. It, it's the uncertainty of the future. Thereby we should be, we should be agile. We have to be flexible. We should be on the toes of every time. Automation is going to help us. There are multiple, multiple other ways. And I think it's so glad to hear that, you know, you, you are almost telling us the same thing and it makes a lot of sense to all of us. So I'll, I'll, I'll go to the next part, Sandeep. How let me, let me, let me, let me, uh, let me say a few quick words on this retrenching and downsizing, because I think it's an important point. And I know, yeah. so I think the question is whether downsizing is really necessary. And if this is not a periodic recession, it is a pandemic recession. And we have to consider whether we can make sacrifices elsewhere to reduce costs because talent is really your biggest investment. Why did you hire these people in the first place? Yeah. If you've got to take them out and, you know, giving pink slips during social distancing is not the most uh, finest thing to do, but you have to treat it with dignity. You have to treat it with fairness and with directness and offer assistance, but don't over -pro promise, but, but you've got to, uh, empathize and, and it's, it's a hard task, but it has to be done. And the good part or the bad part is that employees do understand it. And that's why we will, you know, the relevance of employees becomes very important. No, you're right. You're right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and to be very honest, all said and done. And, and the good news that you have given to all the people in the room is that 140 million jobs will certainly be added. And I think that's a, that's a big silver, silver lining for, uh, for everyone across. Uh, moving to the next uh, next point that comes in my mind, uh, Sandeep, is in today's scenario, how do you think a colleague or an employee should remain relevant? What are your thoughts around it? You know, uh, I just a couple of days ago, I was talking to somebody and he said a very beautiful line to me. He said, you know, when the sea is stormy and the fishermen can't go out into the sea, uh, they spend time repairing their nets. Hmm. So, which is very relevant, you know, for right now you can't go out into the sea, so you better repair your nets. Uh, we, um, you know, your plan A is what you're doing right now and that's got massively disturbed. So now you've got plan B. You have to think about a new path. Are you doing a job? Are you doing a career? And usually your second act is more, um, meaningful uh, and you have to understand your skills and when I say understand your skills not the skills that you think you're good at but what your friends your colleagues and your people around you think you're good at and then you have to market those skills to the opportunity so everybody is talking about new skills learning etc so what are these new skills for example so um, you know you've got uh, analytical thinking you've got active learning you've got tech design you got design thinking, you got technical competence, you know, all these things are going to be, you got to take the escalator to all these issues because they are not, not the time has come. There's no more waiting for the time when artificial intelligence will be relevant or machine learning. will. Be. It's already there now. It's, 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 it's it jump started. <laughs> it's, it's not, it's not waiting anymore. I would say that, you know, it's also very important for people to take charge of their lives and not immerse in self pity and not expect charity either from organizations or the environment because the fire is raging. I mean, let's not be uh, naive about it. And uh, you know, the thing is that many, many centuries ago, your Socrates said the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not fighting the old, but on building the new. So you have to build the new. Now you must understand that some human skills are very, very critical, which will, which will, which will take a long time. I know artificial intelligence is chipping away at it, but things like creativity, originality, taking initiative, 
critical thinking, persuasion, negotiation, attention to detail, resilience, flexibility, problem solving, emotional intelligence, leadership, social influence, service businesses. I mean, this is still there. And you know, people have to build on these, like somebody said, um, one Harvard professor said, uh, of course, he, I don't know where he got the figure from, but he said, we've got now what to do, lifelong learning. This COVID interference has taught us something called lifelong learning. And he says at a minimum, you should do a hundred and one days, so almost a fourth to a third of, of your of your work life. So which means that now learning is, is not going to be held back. And a university degree is no longer going to be a meal ticket for a job. And digital is fine. You know, online courses are fine. There will be a time when you know people can't travel, they can't go out. I already know of a lot of, uh, including my own daughter, who's unable to go to US to her university. And God knows when will she be able to go. And they will start online courses. And I don't know how long those online courses will, will, will carry on for. So, you know, now these courses are becoming relevant. So it's not, not something that you do as a hobby anymore. It's something that is now real. So now we are doing these video calls. It's important for individuals to understand that they are not physically there. How can they be relevant? How are they appearing to be creative on these calls? How are they doing team working? And how are they... Be, 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 and displaying engagement with the organization. So these are, I think, some of the things that will be truly, truly required for them to uh, become more and more relevant in what they're doing. I'm not talking of learning just a new language or learning how to cook a new recipe or uh, learning a musical instrument. That's all there. But I yeah. must say that job-related learning, if you are not familiar with technology and you're not easy with technology, please examine and check your pulse and see if it's beating because you're not relevant anymore. Absolutely. Absolutely. Very well said. And I think today's context, it makes such a lot of sense. Had someone said it a few years back, it would have been like aliens talking something, but then yeah, uh, it is, it is definitely very, very relevant. So for all the people on the call, in case if you have any questions, please put it on the chat so that I can place it to um, uh, Sandeep sir. So Sandeep, one, one question, uh, which I obviously just, I was just thinking, what, are, what is Sandeep Das doing in these days? What is Sandeep Das engaging himself? He's trying to read all the uh, Pinterest sites to see how to grow the finest beard and mustache. <laughs> <laughs> So actually, um, I have spent a lot of time, uh, like many people would have done, a uh, lot of time introspecting, thinking about life uh, beyond this. Um, I think a lot of us have also fished out our bucket lists and said, what are the various things we want to do? Uh, I've also tweaked it a little bit because I've got a little more time. Um, I've, You know, what is very strange, you know, Samir, is that we always kept saying, yeah, Time ni milta, time ni milta, or jab time mila, so we don't know what to do with it. Absolutely. So, so I think um, I have uh, revived my uh, writing. I love writing, so I've started writing again. I have illustrate. I like sketching, so I've illustrated a book uh, which my uh, one of my colleagues is writing. So I've done some illustrations for his book. I have. Um, uh, started learning uh, music uh, on my keyboard from my teacher who's in, uh, who's, uh, who does a Zoom call with me from Bombay. Uh, I started going back to some of my music. I've really, uh, I was very enamored by the fact that Warren Buffett reads 84 books in a year and Bill Gates does about 45 to 50. So I'm trying to average one a week right now. And it's, 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 I'm not, I'm getting there slowly because, you know, we all love instant gratification. So it's very, very different, difficult. But um, uh, I think uh, those are some of the things that I've started gardening again. And so my terrace garden is looking quite good. Uh, so every time, every time a flower blooms, you know, I feel very, very good. Like, oh, wow. said, you know, he's smelling the roses. So I'm actually smelling the roses. <laughs> and a lot of family time. I think a lot of good conversations with my wife, my, my mother, my children, my friends. 
uh, it's 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 a very gainful time. I'm I'm very happy about very grateful about this time. I must say, uh, it it yes. only sort of uh, it only reminds me of what somebody says. One day, even this will be over, and we will be grateful for life in many ways we never felt was possible before. You know, so uh, and and like they say, you know, often when you are at the end of something, you are actually at the beginning of something else. I agree. I agree. So well said. Sir. So well said. And uh, and seriously, that's something uh, most of us aspire to do: read books. And I think target of one per week is absolutely doable, provided we have the willingness and and we just prioritize ourselves. But thank you for sharing that. So I have I have a few questions. So yeah, I quickly ask you the question. So one is telecom industry is getting benefited by COVID nineteen because of because. Every, everyone is looking for more bandwidth do you see more companies investing in telecom well just yesterday i sent a, a message to the telecom employees as a part of uh, a little video that was created by telecom stalwarts is that uh, you know while medical practitioners and other people everybody has done a lot of good work during covid I think the telecom employees are the real unsung heroes. They have kept us all connected, and irrespective of what anybody might say, if we did not have telecom and internet networks, we would really be all over the place. Absolutely. And, and I think they have done a wonderful thing. Uh, I I said in my message to them, and I'll repeat it here. I think the business is getting a second wind. Uh, we we launched mobile phones in this country, and it changed us. We did broadband; it changed us. Now we are going to see the digitalization of this whole country and it changes. Like for example, all this while the debate was on on whether something like 5G is feasible or not. Does it have use cases? Now it's not the question of use cases. Of it's not a question of why. How quickly can you do it? I mean, there is AI, there is 5G, there is uh, you know remote uh, hospitalization, remote education. Everything can be done now remote, you know. So and and how do you do it if you don't have things like five G and internet and connectivity? So the government, the people, the policies, the private operators, the telecom employees, they must be ready because I think this is the second wind. Uh, it is certainly a very very promising time again. Absolutely, absolutely. Another interesting question which comes from the fact you spoke about compassion. Why showing kindness benefits business and society? That comes from a friend from Mumbai. Well, we are all uh, creatures of a society. We belong to society. We are because of society. Businesses are because of society, and and you can't sort of uh, underestimate or or sometimes we tend to be very very um, what should I say um, selfish in the manner we go about our profits. but we have to understand that our very being is because of the community around us and all those companies that have traditionally done well historically are ones that have given back to the community because the community rewards them for their empathy and therefore it is not a kindness it is it is really the duty of these people is nobody is doing the community a favor uh, you thrive because of the community it's your it's your job you've got to make sure at all points of time that you are you are responsible citizens and covid was a great moment for people to display this and all those who have done it the consumers will not forget them he will said and very well articulated i'm sure he'll be happy to hear your answer uh another question which comes from hyderabad is that some leaders say that in times of adversity people come together how true is that very interesting well which is which is i, I would say it's true because you know uh, it's like being in the battlefield you know the kind of friendships that develop between soldiers when they are sitting in trenches and bullets are flying all around them that friendship can never be lost you can never build it across a cup of tea or because you meet somebody socially it's when adversity surrounds all of you and you have no place to hide you go and work with another human being this is where teamwork builds up it always it's, it's it's absolutely true i mean and covid has been a great time you know if i if you if you recall the earlier part of my speech i said that now we are using words like community compassion doing things together collaboration 
these words had gone out of style you know they have come back yeah they have, they have come back just like the uh, wild animals are coming back <laughs> the birds of the migratory birds are coming back you know the most important thing is covid has made us feel human mm. all over again you know the joy of humanity has come back again and i'm my only worry would be samir what will happen when things get normal again how quickly will we forget or will we have learned lessons for the first time because this is that reboot button the reset button did we really reset or are we going to reset it i think very very right and that's that's a common worry across the across the organizations across the fraternity what happens once we start going back to normal right uh, i think uh, nature in its own way has has taught us a a, a very small lesson that you know uh, don't don't take it for granted and i think uh, the message was loud and clear okay to moving to the next question uh, while the industry finds work from home to be effective is this going to be long term solution considering people being near near to each other are able to express their most human qualities of collaboration and empathy these are the qualities that cannot be automated the question is will this be a long term or how do you see that going see as i mentioned earlier there would be the fact that this remote working from home and digitization etc has sparked you know it's like the tiger has tasted blood so institutions and everybody has seen how effective it has been it has also destroyed a lot of myths um we have found that um, you know actually speaking um these uh, these zoom calls and stuff like that have not only collapsed uh, geographies but they have collapsed histories people are talking to the friends of the past and everything so i think while there is certainly merit in human interaction uh i am saying that let us not underestimate the or overestimate the value of inter, uh, human interaction i'm saying organizations will have degrees of interaction but there'll be a combination of work from home digitization with human interaction not everything can be done remotely and that is why different organizations will have different ways of <coughs> dealing with this i mean i'll let me give you an example my wife and i stayed in a airbnb and we reached reached this place in the middle of the night it was completely dark and imagine reaching a place at night and not knowing how to enter the the place because it was all remotely done then we had we went on to our phone and fortunately the phone was working we went on to the uh, email and then from the email we got a passcode we pressed the passcode then we went inside and there was no light then suddenly we waved something else and the light came on and we remote control went into our room and we opened it there was not a single human being now ideally it would have been great for a human face because there's not we asians love human faces which is why yeah. we hate talking to answering machines you you watch us talking to an answering <laughs> machine to free uh, years ago people would, would we had the same problem with atms in banks but all that has changed today everybody is uh, not only drawing money they depositing money in atm because that's how the trust in the machine has happened but so it will be a combination i don't think you can eliminate one or the other I, but automation is on the increase for sure absolutely and i think that's what we are hearing from various organizations they are looking forward to adopting work from home uh, up to a certain percentage of their workforce depending on various businesses anything between 10% to 40% 50% is what we are hearing from uh, it so well resonates with me uh, the question another one is how do we perceive the relevance of forums like wp wto uh, wto uh, who etc given that we have witnessed uh, fractures in the way they operate or they have responded well this pandemic has exposed so many things not only who or wto it has exposed governments it has exposed institutions it has exposed us as individuals and that's why i said it has pressed a reboot and reset button it has put us all through inspection and hopefully every time there is a turmoil i mean look uh, when world war happened 
the League of Nations became United Nations. And for a, for a period of 20 to 30 years, United Nations was very effective. Now United Nations, in a sense, has become defunct. But everything has to be re-envisioned and rethought. So all these organizations will go through their own process of relevance. Because if they're not relevant anymore, they will, um, they will fail to find a place in society. They will not get their funding already. Some countries are saying, I'm not going to fund this because it's, it's of no use to me. So everybody has to be relevant. And because they're really tested in these COVID times. So I think it's a very, very good question. All institutions, not only WTO and WHO, but every one of the institutions and companies. You know, there are many companies that are today exploiting COVID situations, even on their online work, providing low quality stuff, not delivering on time, providing uh, stuff which is uh, not reliable. And there are other companies which are going beyond their way to do and solve these problems. The customers will remember all this and they will pay dearly for it. And or they will get rewarded for it. So if nobody is spared in this particular uh, uh, time uh, of our lives. Wonderful. So Sandeep, there is a comment as a question and, and follow up question. So uh, one was on quality time, what you mentioned. So uh, there's a comment from Jaya from Ahmedabad. She says, uh, well said, the quality of time is understood today than ever before. In, in a way, may not be the best. However, it's great to know that the organizations are turning are forced into work from home situation and they now realize that their teams are live are living up to an hour and delivering uh, some even better and are being more accountable so the question over here uh, she says that in times when we when the seas are rough does the captain train their crew when what is the return of investment in trainings at such times and how does one convince organize invest in trainings See, uh, I, I, am, I was always been a great um, proponent of training because, um, you know, uh, let me give you an example of the army and saying that, look, when there's a battle, first you take a lot of time training people how to aim, fire, shoot and all that kind of thing. And after some time, when you run out of, when you have casualties and you run out of people, you hire people and say, Tumko bandhu pakarna aata hai kya? Na, chalo, tum jao. So then what happens is that the quality of soldiering in the front line, I'm exaggerating to a point, but I'm just trying to make a point that if you don't train people adequately, uh, you do not get the kind of, you have to rework things, you make errors, and, and then you have to sort of, you find that because you, you skip the level of intensive training and getting a well-trained person to work, the company is suffering on account of rework, reprocessing, errors, customer unhappiness. All that happens because the person who was on the front line or who was doing a particular job on his desk didn't do it right. And, um, you know, I was a big fan from my childhood and I was very, very uh, fortunate that I managed to get 25 minutes with him one-on-one -on -one when I was at Harvard Business School. It was a gentleman called Jack Welch. Oh. And Jack Welch used to spend almost 40 to 50 man days himself training people, even as group CEO. He had this little uh, place which he used to call the pit and he used to sit in the, stand in the middle of the pit and train people around them. You know, practicing managers are the best trainers. There's no point sending somebody to a training coach because the boss hasn't gone to that coach. This only the employee comes back and the boss comes and says, Acha, weekend mein training kare, ab kaam karna shuru karo. because they're unrelated. But in, in, in Xerox, many, many years ago, the best managers used to be taken off the front line and they used to be asked to become training managers because they wanted to be trained and it was considered to be very prestigious. So Jaya is absolutely right. Training is very, very critical and there is no compromise on training. But now training is changing in the way it is. Technology is doing training in a different way. It's also allowing you to train more. It's allowing you to train wide. It's allowing you to train deep. And therefore, it's an, it's an opportunity to train your people even better. And, and I think uh, that it absolutely goes without saying. Everywhere in the world, training is very important, including training and building up your own children. Yeah, very well said. And I think uh, this certainly helps, Sandeep. So it's, it's all about beliefs, philosophies that a, that a professional is there with. 
Uh, so yeah, a tough way, but then yeah, certainly there. Colonel Ashok writes from Delhi. Uh, I appreciate this crystal grazing from Mr. Sandeep. Wonderful to understand where the world is going through this and getting a peek into the future. Uh, where do you think? Where do you see hospitality and travel industry in the next two years? Hospitality and travel are the worst affected. One of the worst affected businesses, and and I, and my heart bleeds because I know that these businesses have really, really struggled. But again. these businesses have to reinvent themselves i was in a webinar where i was watching um somebody talk about hospitality business as to how they have started rearranging some of the ways in which they are doing their business now and they are relooking at their staff training and their staff ability and improving self help services and all those kind of things i mean look at cinema halls for example if people stop going to cinema halls and and films start getting released online uh what do you do so this reminds me of a very famous uh, article which was almost almost 40 45 years old but is still relevant it is called the marketing myopia by theodore levitt and theodore levitt said at all points of time businesses have to ask themselves what business am i in am i in the business of theater or am i in the business of providing pe- showing people films as entertainment because years ago when television came in it killed theaters then theaters reinvented themselves and started making 70 mm and cinema scope and all those kind of things and suddenly brought the audiences back the filmmakers started making films like avatar because you couldn't see it at home you had to see it in the cinema hall so this battle constantly goes on uh, railways for example they thought they were in the railways business when they thought they were in the transportation business and cheap air fares took away their business in america the airline started taking away the, then the then they started creating the joy of travel by rail the romance of romantic rail so every business has to reinvent itself and this is not restricted to hospitality and and i'm saying every business that we are in has to reinvent itself the consumer behavior is changing the process is changing digitization has happened everybody has to rethink wonderful so uh, i have two three questions so sandeep lot of comp- compliments flowing in and some of them who have worked with you are remembering the fond days of hutch ajay was working with you those days so the, hi ajay <laughs> those those days uh, so so i think uh, one of the co- questions which uh, come in from captain rajesh is that if you have to undo one thing in your life what will it be that there may be many but then which one would be on the top of your agenda and i'll just take two more questions because we are almost running out of time yes I, sandeep i think samir i have offended rajesh somewhere because i think he's asked me <laughs> <laughs> i had i had come prepared for covid i didn't know i had offended him so uh, <laughs> well i i i wish i had spent uh, you know i i'm i'm fundamentally a mechanical engineer and this is off the cuff it's coming to me and i wish i had spent even more time on technology and 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 done something uh, impactful i i wish i could have started uh, uh, an enterprise of my own at some point uh, i wish i could have taught uh, you know in in a college or whatever it is so these are some of the things that uh, i look i don't regret them uh, i don't regret my life i don't regret what has happened but i'm saying that you know i wish i could have done more in these areas uh i could have done more for society and i think i got too engrossed in my business and i in the company business i wish i could i could and anyway i'm trying to make up for lost time and see whether i can do that to impact society and okay so hope that uh, hope captain sharma would be uh, would be okay <laughs> sir i'm sure he'll, he'll reach out to you separately otherwise i, I can i can deal with him <laughs> <laughs> uh so there are uh, there are two questions one what would be the impact of current pandemic on global business environment and don't you think that the uh, atmanirbhar theme of government of india goes against the spirit of free world trade so i think conmi you have already spoken and this is atmanirbhar versus government of india going again free free world trade what are your views no i think i i think a lot of us are misunderstanding uh, 
Atman Nirbharta as uh, being selfish, that I'll only buy and do Indian goods. He did use the word uh, vocal and loyal, uh, but you know, you also, I mean, later on, if you see the finance minister's uh, speech and clarifications on various things, they said, look, we want to be self-reliant in a manner that we can go and uh, make a difference in the world, export and create. Like, for example, let me tell you, give you a very important uh, statistic. You know, most about, um, I don't know how many billions of dollars of money is made by social networking uh, companies you know, like Facebook, Twitter, and all that in India from Indian consumers. Uh, it is not true in, in China. In China, there are substitutes to every one of these social, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, companies. So therefore, if India was able to develop its own, it could earn so much of advertising revenue and all that from creating its own social platforms. And that's where, you know, it becomes self-reliant. Look at, look at Alibaba, for example. And now, and it's true that it doesn't, these things don't take too much time. Look at the way Paytm and others have come forward. Uh, and it, it's a, just a matter of time because you'll see a lot of startups will start doing these things and make relevant things for India. So I think it is not about not being free world trade because I don't want to go back to those days when we used to produce ambassadors and fiats and not allow other cars to come in. And for years and years, we faced the tyranny of those um, uh, cars where everybody else in the world drove beautiful cars. But today, you can manufacture those cars in India. And Indians can buy those same brands built in India. I mean, that's self-reliance. No. So I, I, I think it has to be seen in a much deeper meaning. But and much broader talk. perspective. Much broader perspective. Achandeep, so the last question, the questions are just flowing in and perhaps we go one more, one more hour, it will not end. People are so inspired by what you have actually said. One, one last question, that's on a personal front. Someone is asking that, uh, may I ask Mr. Das on his experience of parenting? There's a lot to learn from him. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you know, parenting, uh, I, I haven't brought up my children the way my parents brought me up or the way my wife's parents brought her up. Uh, but all of us intuitively learn along the way. We are also dealing with, uh, with children who are of very different uh, time as, as opposed to us. Uh, all that, all that my wife and I have, I mean, I would say that my children are a result more of my wife's hard work than mine. I was always away at work. And I like another definition of leadership is, which is saying, which also applies to parenting is how can a father not be an obstacle? So uh, I was not an obstacle. My wife has brought up the children with very, very strong values. I'm grateful to God for what we have with them. They are nice children and uh, they, they, they are very God fearing. They are very diligent. They listen to us. Uh, they have they have achieved things in their own right. Uh, I might be actually guilty of slightly overparenting them and being protective because, as a boy who came from a middle class home, uh, you know I didn't have a lot of privileges that I feel that I give to my children. So I think sometimes you soften them by 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 overparenting them. But I uh, but I think uh, they are great survivors. They've done very well. I have no. Uh, I, I'm grateful to God for that and I'm grateful to my wife because she has spent quality time building up these children. I'm, I'm truly grateful. Thank you for the question though. I... Fantastic. Fantastic. And it's so good to hear. And I think... Uh... Uh, dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, thank you all. Thank you all for joining in. Thank you all for joining in and... Uh, uh, and having uh, shared uh, your questions, I'll not be able to take it any further. You can write those questions across to perhaps Jatin. We will we will take it up with uh, Sandeep and perhaps respond back to you. And Sandeep, coming back to you, thank you so much. It is always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for sparing time for GSCS. We are definitely so excited whenever we meet you up. And it is always amazing. You give us new perspective in terms of how do we look at things. I think it is, it is so, we are so very grateful. So I, on behalf of GACS and all the attendees, 
would would extend my heartfelt thanks thank you once again sir for joining in sabir uh, thank you very much and uh, captain thank you very much uh, we have a score to settle captain later on but uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but anyway thank you very much i would say that it's been a great honor uh that people have uh, you know spent uh, an hour or so trying to listen to me for whatever gibberish i had to say but uh, it's always uh, i'm i'm very very uh, glad to be associated with gscs and you guys you know i've been watching you over a period of a couple of years and you've done some magnificent work and i uh, more power to your elbow and i'm always available to you for any help or assistance that i can give with my uh intuitive experience and, and and i want to wish everybody every participant on this very very safe and happy times ahead to you and your families uh please i would like to say that please be uh mentally and physically healthy that's the most important part of covid nothing else is more important be optimistic because as human beings if we are not optimistic we will not survive and that's what our human quality is so and respect what you have around you that's the most important relationships the environment the people be grateful and you will be fine thank you <laughs>